recording right now. I gotta do a slate in a moment. Okay. Where do I? Oh, oh, it's a lavalier. Jeez, dude, you're professional. I'm trying, on trying. <laughs> And they, they're actually, it's really amazing sound quality. They kind of use these for um, sometimes remotes on. I've done it with acting. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Put it on but, the but, I mean, even, but, sting is usually what they do. But these are like act, the actual recorders. I think usually on set they're tra- on set like they, transistor or yeah. whatever. They are with Which, when my buddy who's a sound guy, you know, let me borrow his, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is the best thing ever. I can go anywhere. And then do it like that so that it's up in there. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Up in there yeah, like that? that? Good, 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 good. Yeah? I think so. Okay. You tell me if it sounds like scrickle, scrickle, scrackle. I'm not going to listen. <laughs> Bernie! Hi, Bernie. He's such definitely a good missing. Boy. We do our hikes almost every day, and it's been like three or four days since we've done this. Right, bud? Oh, right, buddy? So ready to go. Yeah, let me uh, get the slate going. Which is my little fork, <laughs> and I have a little knife here, and I just go. Ooh, Whoa. Ooh. Whoa. <laughs> oh man, Mark! Great, awesome. So back to Jung. <laughs> I don't do any edit. Like this, this is the the lowest produced show in existence. Next to. The one I think I do. Yeah, seriously, no, seriously. <laughs> I have no microphone, so I'll you just do it on your uh, on the computer. Laptop mic? Yeah. Well, my mic broke recently. I had a USB in, in it, oh. a big fatty, and it broke. You gotta you gotta tell Amazon to send you another one. Amazon, he can kiss my ass. No, I know this is the problem. Is like all the good stuff is there, and like, oh, I gotta find it somewhere else. I know it sucks. Wow. Yeah, look at this. An actual mountain that's not attached to some chick putting on her fucking makeup (laughs) (laughs) yeah this is beautiful not used to a trail where there's no influencer blocking the way and it smells amazing it smells like real deep forest (sighs) yeah the uh the Jungian archetype i was given was the prairie turnus the eternal child (laughs) and there was a a, a lady, wish I could remember her name. I think she wrote the book, The Drama of the Gifted Child, and then she had yes. a couple other Which books. my mom hated that I was going to read. My mother was so against me going to therapy. She said, uh, why? So you can discover everything about your narcissistic mother? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, At least kinda. you found a, a certain honesty there. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> How's it going? Hey. Yeah, kind of. Hey. I don't have Barney. my mask up. Uh-oh. Get out of here. I their space. <laughs> Barney. Wee! Look at this. This is so real. Yeah. That's how I feel about the whole place here. Yeah. Like, oh my What's, God, it's so there's real. There's so many layers of trickery and fakeness and narcissism in LA. <laughs> it's such a snaky it's town. what it's built on. Yeah. Well, it's built on an idea of beauty. And it was all Jew, you know, my people, they left New York and they said, I don't ever want to see my mother again. <laughs> and they made everyone blonde and blue eyed. You know. That's hilarious. So <sighs> I, it's so funny because uh, I'll pitch you on this idea. <laughs> I want to do a podcast about religious trauma because I think it's not something that's really discussed uh, and have guests. Cause like I had, it's a great idea. Do you know Natalie Palmides? No, she was uh, she's like a, a clown performer. I know she's the new face of the progressive. She's not, she's the girl that's not flow on the ads. <laughs> okay. And she was a powder puff girl, but I know her through clowning, but she talked about, being obsessed with Santa Claus when she was growing up. And if that is not some kind of religious trauma, I don't know what is. Obsessed with him, like sexually? No, more like (laughs) 
you know, she was still believing in Santa Claus way, way, way late because she was kind of forcing it. And she, she really had a lot of magical thinking about him. I thought she saw him one Christmas and stuff like that. And so it amazes wow. me. You know, it's like kind of where is the, where is our imagination in relation to these spectacular, spectacular things that we're maybe, that we can access, right? Versus like the imprinting of these bad ideas. Because I think ultimately Santa Claus is eh, but he's been so infused with capitalism and corporate agendas. It's like the symbol of Santa Claus has become something different than it originally was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what it originally was was a frightening tale of a, of a man who came to steal the children who were bad. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so. And so the essence of the evil is still in there. Yeah. And I have a, I have a few uh, black family friends who say they don't enjoy teaching their kids about a white man who's going to bring them presents if they're good. Yeah. Right. I find it very, very uh, warped. And propagandistic. Yeah. When again, I think also the, the other aspect of the propaganda with Santa Claus is that, you know, somehow he's watching you. Yes. And like, I just like hate that idea. <laughs> like I was, you know, especially like I, I started obsessing on the idea of God watching me. Right. Right around the time when I was learning how to masturbate. Well, that's the right time. And I was, yeah, well, eventually <laughs> I've turned it into a kink. It's like, yeah, I want God to jo- walk, watch me jerk off. The other thing I, I started thinking about, and I don't know if there's a, a joke in here, but it's like, yeah, God fucking loves watching little kids jerk off. That's his favorite thing. <laughs> He's into that. He's into all of it. Yeah. He's definitely. He's a real freak. He's definitely a freak. He definitely this, likes all the wild. This is and is great. it he? I mean, come on. Well, I mean, in this sense, he is. Them? It, yeah, this... No, but I'm saying, like, this aspect of God right, is masculine idea. and creepy. And he's mean, <laughs> and he's punishing. Yeah, he's making you feel guilty for jerking off, but he's fucking getting off on it. Right. <laughs> it's kind of the ideal. <laughs> now, if I could just get paid. <laughs> exactly. He's like, I don't even need money. No, isn't it? Oh, this fucking... Look at all that snow. Yeah. I'm in shorts. This is wild. It's, it's lovely. Love it's it. perfect. It's so perfect. It is just like... Kind of can't We have found a fantastic little piece of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to stop at Phoenix. And I have my friend, Aubrey, who's a... Uh, an artist just moved out there. So nice. But yeah, you're gonna I, I do a bunch of these and I only usually release one on the Libsyn feed. So this will be yours yours will definitely be a Libsyn worthy one. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Libsyn worthy. <laughs> How's it going? Hey. Yeah, this is the thing. Uh, I've been hiking since the beginning of the shelter in place. Yeah. And I'm just like, just my habit. Just. You got to let people pass. It's nice. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah, Jung. Uh, Yeah, Jung. So what is, what is your, your archetype? What are you working on? Well. What are you learning about yourself? The funny thing is I haven't really been given anything. It's. It's way more, it's way more of her, like, asking one or two questions within the session, and then me kind of falling (laughs) back and going, oh, fuck, right. You know, she said something to me recently uh, regarding... My anxiety. And she said, have you ever, have you ever tried to live 
in the moments and in the in the space that's unfamiliar. And I was like, "What do you mean?" And she goes, "You know, it's un what's unfamiliar is to feel good, feel deserving, feel calm, feel at peace." So what's it like to live there? Like experiment. What happens when you go there? Oh, yeah. Very heavy, but very simple. Yeah. Because I think that's the thing. Uh, those of us that have had trauma. Yeah. Is afraid of because any moment, whatever, I felt things are okay. The other shoe would drop or something. Right. Something would happen. Right. And, uh. So, or you know what? So my PTSD was just always this anticipating bad things were going to happen. Right. Yeah. Or not. I, I actually talked about this last night with someone. Not even having those moments. Yo, know, just you're, you're relentlessly in the trauma. Yes. Because you're constantly surviving. Yeah. So when the child learns how to just survive at all times and it's always on survival mode. When the grown up starts to take over. The child doesn't trust it and doesn't trust that there's gonna, that there's safety now, that there's calm now, that there's peace now, that we can sit and be quiet and nothing bad will happen to us, that no one's coming to get us. Yeah. So I t- talk to people a lot about this because I have to talk to myself out loud and say, Jessica, it's okay. I got it. I got you. Yeah. But that, that's, I mean, that's part of your self-soothing regime. Yeah. Instead you know, of going to take you know, a drink or smoke or whatever and, or eat or fuck someone I don't like. <laughs> Those are all my addictions. <laughs> Boy, do I like I mean, to fuck so, someone I'm I don't just going like. to say this. It's so intense to fuck somebody you like. <laughs> I wish I knew what that felt like. <laughs> well, no, but I'm also saying like somebody you care about and you care about their well-being, and it's like you're present with that and again like present in those emotions of caring about this person and touching them and it's like yeah, love's too much for me. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> like, if I can handle that, dude. I it's I walk around my new apartment like Eddie Murphy from Trading Places when they bring him to the new house. Yeah. They're like, no, this is yours. I'm like, uh-huh, sure, uh-huh, uh-huh. And they're like, no, you don't have to steal it. It's yours now. And I'm like, right, right. No certainty of things not falling apart. Or being more... Here's the thing, Sean. Yeah, yeah. Being more comfortable... In the uncomfortable. Yes. And that's but just a drag, man. It's, t- it's tough. But I, will, I, I went and did this meditation retreat at the beginning of the year. Uh-huh. Uh, kind of, I, I finished my recovery right at the tail end of the six weeks. The, the Vipassana retreat center said, hey, come on out. People are counseling. You can have a spot. And I was like, yeah, this is perfect. Left Barney behind. Went and had a, you know, 10-day silent meditation retreat. Wow. It was painful on the, the silent and the not touching people. But Ugh. the reset it did to my brain and being being comfortable in the discomfort, just the discomfort of my body, the, the discomfort of my thoughts. Yeah. It really did prepare me for this fucking bullshit we're going through right now. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. That makes sense. No, it makes sense because when we first got put on this, I was with a boy. He lasted about four weeks before he completely imploded. Yeah. And I had to ask him to leave. Yeah. Someone who can't, anyone... Who can't sit quietly and have their stuff come. I mean, it's very hard. It's very hard. Well, it's, and, very, it's very hard for those of us that, you know, that, that have depth and have some, some things that we've, you know, whatever, had taken away from us that we care about. Like, it's like, I, I think it is very tough. I think it's easy for fucking empty-headed bilbo, bimbos to do it because they don't <laughs> fuck. their minds are empty. So it's like... I got nothing to worry about. But those of us that give a shit, you know, yeah. that sounds like he gave a shit a little bit. Well, yeah, but also I think, like you said before, when you have so much, when you come from so much trauma and you, you either think you have a choice or you don't. Yeah. And I think that he did not, the man I was dealing with did not think he had a choice. Yeah. So he imploded and I knew I had a choice I knew this was going to be a real 
intense kind of situation. And he used to fuck with me and say, well, what do you want to do? Just fucking sit in your house? Sure. And I go, yeah, if I'm listening to a nice podcast or yeah. the, the sun is out or I can eat a good little meal by myself, I would love that. Yeah. And instead of running about and trying to get these feelings to go away. Yeah. It's a... Uh, God, you mentioned something in there, being being at peace with yourself. Oh, man. I was like, oh, I had this thought the other day that... I'm just saying these words to see if it'll prompt this thing I forgot, but I can't remember. Which, again, it doesn't matter. That's the other thing is, like, the, I think the world is starting to learn that most of the stuff that we fill up our lives with doesn't really matter, yeah. you know? And I think it's, a, I think, I think especially Americans, we have a cultural trauma from being run around by corporations and capitalism and the elites that we have all this fucking kind of like cultural PTSD about like, oh, what do I do with myself? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea how to keep just a calm, like the... What was interesting for me, this is just, I can't go without it's a beautiful. shot. Um, the, uh, the thing that really tripped me out about my feed over the last few days in terms of social media uh, was um, that I follow a few Native guys and they were talking about how the real, the real politics are in how we treat nature. Yes, absolutely. And then 100%. that's the only thing that matters. matters. <laughs> so I got two, two things I want to say on that. The first yes, thing please. is, do you know about the, the Wedigo? The who? Wedigo? No. So it's a... Is this a tribe? No, well, it's, an, it's a... I think it's Algonquin, but it's, it's this spirit demon that they identified in white people when we first got here <laughs> they it, it's basically Whoa. it's basically a cannibal self-cannibalizing demon that Not they right. saw us like this this rapacious need to acquire 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 yeah. they're like oh they're possessed by way to go either they will <laughs> they will con consume themselves or it will leave their bodies Little did they know that we have quite a taste for the, for for being demonically possessed. Oh yeah, we love it. Yeah, and so, then we so can I call think, in some gods and do all kinds of that shit. So I, I think yes, I think that Jesus. if we don't, stopped again. Yeah, yeah. I think that I have this fantasy that kind of once we get through, and it may be another four years of American trauma. I don't know. Because I don't think it's going to be necessarily solved, even if Biden gets... Uh, I don't think so either. But if we were to take the effort of fighting, uh, of remediating the planet, fighting it the way we fought the Nazis in World War II, then I think we'd have a chance of turning it around. If we put all of our resources and energy into remediation and yeah, figuring but... out what that means and how it works and... Putting, I, I also, I mean, my other part of the fantasy is that Arnold Schwarzenegger becomes the spokesperson for it. Because right? he's got such international appeal, you know? It's, but he, what? He, he could be that the guy. That means we have to renounce all of our material stuff. Well, we think, love stuff. I think at a certain point, it'll just be so taxed or so that, that or made so hard and unavailable like single-use plastics Ugh. how hard is that going to be to 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 stop us from doing that yeah it's gonna be fucking because i ordered something yesterday that had some single-use plastics in it uh and i'm very aware of it it's gonna be hard but i think yeah. you know whatever we we've, we've well, I wanted to say we stopped Nazism, but I guess we didn't Not really. really. They're still here. It's so sad. We at least stopped uh, German Nazis. Well... We can just can we can only sh we can just start only shopping at Goodwill. Yes. Uh, a friend of mine just got very angry with me that I told him I bought a pot. He's like a new pot. I, I said, mean, if it's an item that you're going to get a lot of use out of. Yeah, but he goes, you could have gone to the thrift shop and gotten a pot. We don't yeah. need any more pots in the fucking world. And I'm like, they already made the pot, okay? That's, I mean, he does have a point. I, yeah. But I will also say, hi, like this is the other thing is like. High quality, highly usable. There's a lot, a lot less of that in our uh, out there. But if you can find that and invest in that and give that company your money, yeah, yeah. And hopefully sure. it's a smaller company. I mean, my friend just ordered me a magic blanket, which is a weighted blanket. Oh fuck yeah! But he knows the man at Magic. 
What is that? Is that the wind? Is that the wind? The trees? Holy shit. It sounds like rapids. It did for a second. Right, bud? What is that? What is that? They're coming to get it us. It sounds like water. Just as so much rustling leaves. I'm such a city person. I'm like, this is kind of scary. I mean, there's a part of me. Don't just hear there. There's a part of me that's like, do we have to get to higher ground? You know? I'm like, where's the murderer? <laughs> do I have to? No, I don't even think that... about na- nature killing us. I'm like, where's the hatchet man in this place? Oh, I was, I'm kind of thinking like it was definitely, a, a, yes, for sure, a warning sound of some sort. Yeah, like, you better get your asses down from this mountain, Whitey. It was like, Whoa. Dude, it sounded crazy. It was it sounded amazing. sounded like a fucking rapids was coming towards us, like water was yes. about to rush us. Oh. Dude. We're on, we, like, this is the first time I've seen snow in maybe eight years. The Easily. snow is beautiful. I can't believe we're walking on snow. I'm in shorts. Again, I'm yeah. going to just say, I'm in I shorts. I'm still in California. Don't, you know, don't, get, don't get twisted. <laughs> no. You are still a person of the flip-flop. I don't. I don't want to be considered that. <laughs> it's, hey, it's hard to, it's hard to get, out, get it out of the system. It is. I went to New York for almost 20 years, and I even dyed my hair dark, and they were like, L.A.? And I was like, fuck. <laughs> hey, it? though, I, as... as because uh, because I think of like these like these vortex cities, right? They talk about Sedona, yeah. San Francisco. L.A. is a is a vortex, but they also say it is like a dark vortex, an evil vortex. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's during the '60s we produced fucking the Doors, that one of the darkest fucking hippie bands. Well, I wouldn't necessarily name the Doors. <laughs> Well, no, but I'm saying as compared to, to like the of, fuck. What that, about Charles Manson? Well, yeah, no, no. I'm saying I'm saying music wise compared oh, okay. to like the Grateful Dead. I was like, oh my god, stand by, Sean. Stand no, no, by. I know. We have a lot of evil. We made cults. <laughs> L.A. made cults. Yes. Do you fucking, know there were no cults till L.A. made them? <laughs> I mean, we had whatever, whatever, fucking Amy Semple and fucking all those. We yeah. had a. Uh, uh, What's her name? Who is the pimp? Come on, Amy. Amy Fleischman. No. Oh yes, yes, yes. Right? Uh, yes, the the uh, the pimp. Uh, yeah. The lady pimp. And I, then she was the Heidi Fleiss. Heidi Fleiss. Yeah. And she was the one who got busted, and they didn't bust any Anybody of her else. Johns. Anybody else? <sighs> Fucking lady has to so take the fall. Fucked. You know, knows Martha Stewart. Always took the took fall. Took the fall. And her, and it was her inciting trading guys that did it. Yeah, she's not a fucking trader. OJ, but again, OJ did it. OJ but again, no, but again, but here's the thing: OJ's OJ murder. still took the fall. Where guys of a similar profile wait uh, took what fall? You mean for the robbery? No, no, I'm, I'm saying they. Well, he he still got accused and had to go through the the trial where other people in his position, if they were white, would not have had to go through it. Right. That's my point. So we don't ever see white men killing their wives. In, we don't see court cases of white men who've killed their wives. Is no. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I guess Aaron Hernandez is Mexican. Well, we had Scott Peterson. Oh, yeah. The Lacey Peterson guy. Yeah. But that's about it. And what about the kid? They never found the kid's killer. Benet. No. Nope. John Benet Ramsey. Well, I, you, know the, you know the rumor on that, right? Parents. Well, actually, the brother, the older brother. No. And they're covering up for him. Was he jealous? No. So it sounds was like he, he was it? at the time, and they, it, they think they pushed through it, but he was developmentally disabled, oh. and he was a few years older, and he oh. was just like one of those developmentally disabled, angry kids. And they were giving all of their attention to John Bonet. So he was like a Lemmy, like she was like his yes. rabbit. Yeah, and then eventually now he's at Duke, and they've kind of, because they're a rich family, they were able to deal with a lot of his behavioral issues, and so he he's coming off like a typical, whatever, Duke <laughs> student, whatever that means, you know. Oh, you mean Duke College. Duke I thought College. you meant he was, like, he was Duke, <laughs> like, royal. Like, how the fuck did he become a Duke? <laughs> hey, if you got to Duke College, it's basically... <laughs> well, they're like, you know what, are you retarded? So are the Blue Bloods. Come on over. <laughs> <laughs> fucking bunch of inbred fucking tardos. Yeah, so so I so all of that is it was ba- it's basically the parents because they weren't able to protect one child from the other. Oh shit. Yeah, but the, a lot of the true crime people have dug into it and they're like, yeah. Oh, it was it was actually um 
uh, what's her head McNamara, Paul, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Patton Oswalt's wife. Right. At an ass cat at UCB. Right. She's telling all these stories. She's like, she's like, oh, tell, bring up a true crime and I'll tell you who really did it. And then somebody said John Bonet and she says, yeah, it's the brother he's going to Duke right now, blah, blah, blah. Wow. I was like, holy shit. Wow. Yeah. Are you a murderino? No. I mean, I listen to a lot of it. I listened to the first two seasons, especially when it was on poor little Dustin's uh, <laughs> network. <laughs> poor little broken Dustin. Well... But, you know. Yeah. Oh, they're huge now. I yeah. mean, it's, it's a phenomenon, actually, I think. It's a phenomenon. Oh, and, I th- and again, I think they are both amazing, like, performers, and they're so good at what they do. I and didn't I, know them. I, know, I kind of knew Georgia when she was with Allie on their original stuff that they were doing. They were doing a bunch of cooking shows. Mm-hmm. So I've kind of known her from that. And then, obviously, Karen's been around. Yeah, I was Karen on, I know only because of the scene you know but i was i mean i've met her a few times but i the one time uh you know dave um holmes at uh before meltdown closed that he had the uh the friday 40 Mm -hmm. and you know it was just basically a panel show and they'd ask questions and i fucking volunteered to be up and it was fucking karen and chris fairbanks and me and i was like wow what a great panel holy shit what a fun panel It it was amazing but yeah, Karen's been doing her podcast with Chris for whatever, however long. And then, you know, and, and Georgia had her own career. And when they came together on this, it was, <laughs> what was that? Remember uh, Heart to Heart? <laughs> when they met, it was murder. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Karen is Robert Wagner. I, I think so. Yes, yeah, for sure. She's got to be. Was it and Stephanie Zimbalist? She who, would take that as a compliment. What was it? Was it Stephanie Zimbalist who was? Uh, no, Steph- she had red hair. I I don't remember her name in the. I remember Max was the 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 kind of butler the driver guy that guy. was like the help guy who helped them. You know, they were just basically gentleman detectives. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, it was yes. him and his wife. Yeah. Oh yes, we shall. We're the rich people that are like, yes, we shall solve these crimes. I know, but so are Charlie's Angels. Like everyone's I guess very that's true. privileged. <laughs> like, that's true. They all have the this, detectives. Have, holy shit! Except for Beretta. Beretta was like a blue collar. Like, uh, wait one second. Uh, oh, you mean Colombo? Let me ask you one more question. You mean Colombo? Colombo. But Beretta, Beretta? Though, Beretta was a real fucking cop, right? Beretta was I, with the bird, or Colombo was with the bird. Uh, Beretta was the, with the bird, but okay. he was a real cop who had a chip on his shoulder, and that's why they made a show about a him. Bird. But Colombo, I think I want to say Colombo was a like an actual police detective. But and, he would fuck up, and then he'd cl- he'd figure it out by fucking it up. Yeah. By and getting he'd always people to make re- them like confess, reveal themselves. Yeah. He would bumble. He played the bumbler. Yeah, I, 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 I call that in my head the Scotty syndrome on Star Trek, where it's like Scotty's always, ah, I'm giving her all she's got, Captain. I don't know if we're going to pull it off. But every fucking single time, he fucking pulls it off. <laughs> and I, so I modeled a lot of my professional post-production career at, off of that. Off Scotty? Off of Scotty, meaning like I go into post-production and I'd be like, oh man, this is a lot. You've got these really high expectations and da da da. We're going to need more money and time and blah, blah, blah. And then fucking pull off a miracle every single time <laughs> but that's i mean you know you kind of got here's what i say about hollywood like having any career anywhere in hollywood it is a dramatic fucking industry it is built on drama yeah. so if you do your job without any drama they're not going to remember you and they may not call you back but if you i always tell people if they get on a shoot all you have to do is not fuck it up, not cost anybody any money, and save the production one time. If you save the production one time, then they will fucking rehire you forever and ever and ever. Like the, the time I fucking was able to fucking pull a, an all-nighter with Tom Cruise. <laughs> or, well, not Tom Cruise. It was his package for the Kids' Choice Awards. and uh, Or no, um, Critics' Choice Awards. And then I fucking stayed there for 36 hours. Pulled off a miracle, but that's just Hollywood. Back to Jung. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, so it's almost like it's almost like these koans they present you put you in a very specific kind of thought process or meditative state. I uh, don't know. I think yes, I think there's something to that where you mean there's just like one or two lines that go real deep, but yeah. 
what I think the practice has been for me with her, with this, is understanding that because of where we come from with this traumatic history, that the feelings that come up are totally legitimate. That it's not just this fucking anxious adult who's like, fuck, I can't fucking figure this out. You know, it's no. Yeah. This is this baby frightened fucking child who's completely in calamity. That's how children think. Yeah. Um, Catastrophic thinking all the time. Right. So if you're, if you can be witness to your child as the adult and to whatever, whatever that means. A lot of times for me, it just means taking a minute, taking a breath, maybe crying a little bit for something that mm. I never cried about. Yeah. More in that, more in that part, whatever that meant. And yeah, some children like ourselves had a daily struggle with, with issues. So there's so much that the kid still hasn't processed. So my practice is now to be really, really gentle when that comes up and to know that it's old and to know that it's just never been felt and to know that the only way to get through everything that we deal with so much is feeling it. Yeah. Letting it happen. It's sad and it's scary and it's painful, but it's momentary. It's momentary. It's not going to be, and you learn that right in the program where if you, if you don't cling to these things, they're going to pass. And you learn that in Buddhism and in meditation, the thoughts, you're not trying to get rid of thoughts. You're trying to remember that they're not who, what you are. You're not made up of these thoughts. These thoughts, there's nothing. Somebody once said in a meditation that I was at, thoughts are not good for anything except not bumping into furniture. I always say the, the, the thing I use is like the brain is an organ in our body. B- thoughts can be just like the fart of your brain. <laughs> it meaning like it's just a biological process, yeah. but we happen to give it a little more. Oh, we and again, like if we, if we talk about the indig- indigestion of a bad childhood, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. You got to fucking bar for puke or think dreams you know push those those things have to fucking come out they have to you know you got to fart them out well that's why yoga is such a great practice for a lot of people because there's certain positions where your muscles are getting stretched where the memory has been caught and that for me i had a very hard time doing yoga i couldn't practice for a long time because i was triggered in every position yeah and I thought, well, I'm not going to come here and weep on a yoga mat for an hour and a half. <laughs> and then my teacher goes, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> no, if that's what you need, if that's what exactly. your yoga practice is. Exactly. So again, and you know, shit like the artist's way, I shouldn't say shit, but the book like the artist's way, which I, I swear by this goddamn yeah. book. If you put the practices in practice, they will create things in your life that you didn't think you were capable of creating. Capable of being gentle. Here yeah. comes that noise. Yeah. It's so funny when I mentioned the Wendigo, the Wendigo, and I think he is associated with wind. I was like, are we? Is yeah, the, you is the just got it. Is, is the Wendigo coming? Because there us? was no, we didn't have any wind going up the hill. Nope. That was magic, man. It is magic. Uh, so, well, magic's so, real, I know. Well, so I was going to say this about Jung. Yeah. I think, and there's people like, whatever, like Jack Parsons, Aleister Crowley, even, I would even say like, Robert Oppenheimer, the, yeah, the sure. where they were, st- you know, Robert Oppenheimer read from the, not the Bhagavad Gita, the other, the Vedic, the, he, the, he read a Vedic thing uh, when they blew up the first bomb. Mm. I am the destroyer of worlds. I think that's a thing that Vishnu or somebody says. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there is, there is a, he cast a spell. He ritualized that moment. Right. So I think what happened, like in that moment, Whatever the dark or light or the mysterious aspect of magic, it changed in that moment and it kind of went more underground and science became this kind of more prominent idea. And well, so, also because the idea of witches and feminine, they didn't want the feminine to be so powerful. And really the idea of a witch... I mean, my mom always told me that we were witches because mm-hmm. we practiced 
uh, naturopath. Yeah. F we folk practice homeopathy. Yeah, we folk practice medicine. Yeah. Astrology. We practice astronomy. You know, it was all these things that had to do with earth and sky, you tides that? and, you know, moon. And so the idea that the strength of a, of a woman, or you could say the weakness as well, comes with her moon. Sure. And yeah. And... I once went to a sweat lodge ceremony and they wouldn't let me in the lodge. Because you were on your period? Because I was on my period. Well, I think... And they told me I was too strong. They said, you'll take the power from the lodge. That's how strong you are at this moment. And, yeah. and that was so un-American to me. I didn't understand at all what that meant. And then I... I have the right to bleed wherever the fuck I want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I'm... didn't... I was so confused and I understood how... I felt really... I didn't want to go before we went, and I thought I was just being like a shitty uh, young woman. And then when I got there, I realized it was a real instinct that I could listen to, and that oh, it was gotcha. right. Oh, gotcha. Interesting. So I think, yeah, I think like so much of, yes, where we're at in late capitalism is definitely a patriarchal, like it's manacling the, the population in a way that doesn't allow the imagination of whatever that could be. I, I can't put a name on it, but it definitely has a lot to do with feminine energy. Definitely has to do with intuition. It's the unproven. Yes. It's this idea that there's something beyond us. Yes. That we're not all fucking knowing. That we're not all seeing. That we're not this stupid thing that we we talked we started this show with the idea of this all seeing, all knowing, punishable yeah. God. Yeah. And if we all think of ourselves in that incarnation, what a joke, man. Well, I mean, That's why the native folk had it right. We are not anything except here to serve back to Mother Earth. Yeah. They well, took and they gave back. Well, we're also part of it. Right. We're, you know, this it's is like, how it works. We're, we're just these fucking... Vessels. We have weird fucking water meat creatures that popped out of the blah, blah. Yeah. we just popped out of it yeah you know we're walking around on top of it but we're still part of it yeah you know which we should probably take our shoes off to do this <laughs> oh my feet are so tender though i know so, i'm just so used to shoes all the time <laughs> it's so it's funny so cold. it's it's true i i'm uh because I've been doing so many hikes, you know, right. I'm trying, I'm going to go to see a podiatrist so he could give me some, uh, what do they call those things that you put in your shoes? Oh, um, I don't know. Correctors. Or yeah, something? whatever. There's a, there's a, a word for it. And I'm like, just so I can trot on mother earth more comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I was a true healer, I'd tell you, just remove your shoes yeah. next time. Well, I, it's so funny because I summited Mount Baldy in my five finger my vibro oh god i remember those yeah you yeah. wore those to class yeah and i and i went to the top of the hill and i was it was amazing and exhausting and i'm glad i did it but then i decided to switch into fucking regular boots no on the way down oh no and that's where you're and and i was that's just like you fucked just up. stumbling the whole way shut the fuck up yeah you know that makes sense yeah because i just didn't i wasn't using the same muscles coming down that i'd use going up right um, I want to say this about Jung real quick. Yeah. So I Jung. think he was at the age, especially when he wrote the Red Book. Is that the one of his mystical kind of teachings? I don't know. I'm, I wish I were more familiar with his books. So yeah, this one, this is one that like people were just like, "Come on, bro, what are you doing?" <laughs> but you know, Why? Why? <laughs> you know what was because he because it was his mystical teachings. Uh -huh. So he approached these ideas of the archetypes and these deep kind of like subconscious realms as mysterious mysterium as like the occult as mystical yeah. and in the in the you know freud's one of the reasons they had to break is because jung was so much more open to the idea that were there was something beyond what what we could show evidence for yes. and because you know freud, freud was trying to really promote this very specific thing, he didn't want there to be any... No outside forces. Yes, he didn't want it to seem unscientific. <laughs> right. Yeah, he wanted it to be like a... He, this, yeah. Yes, I agree with you. And he also really was very rigid. Oh, yeah. And he was very rigid about 
the well, idea of sex. Oh, for sure. But that's because he was a big old coke fiend. Well, yeah. And he was German. I mean, I hate to talk shit well, about the Germans, but my well, actually, goodness. Was he Austrian? Austrian, German. Yeah, but I still. feel like Eastern European... Is that Eastern? Well, no, but this is, that's, the, that's the culture that produced Hitler. Right. Yeah. So it's a very strict and rigid uh, piece. And I love that Jung came in and said, wait, wait, wait. We can't be in control of all of this. Right? Yeah. There's no way. There's a definite mystical realm that has a lot of uh, power if we allow ourselves to tap into it. Yes. Well, and I think, and again, like I could, I could say it as simply as this, because this is like uh, my, one of my gurus is uh, Michael Bernard Beckwith over at Agape, right? It could just be the power of our creative imagination, but that power is so powerful and we don't tap into it enough. And we know the placebo effect really works. Yeah. So if you use your creative imagination as a way to exercise, the demons heal your body, whatever, Mm -hmm. and there's a profound healing inside of you, then it doesn't matter where it comes from. Yeah, (laughs) then it doesn't matter where it comes from. Exactly. You know, I guess part of, part of one of the the reasons I even mentioned that is I'm trying to be on the margin between atheism and mysticism because I think there's power in both of them. Yeah. Because I think the power in for me, the power in when I became an atheist was about rejecting the magical thinking that was foisted upon me by other people, by Did the you culture. Grow up religious? Uh, yeah, my, my, my grandfather was a Christian minister. He was a tent revival minister. Mm. So we have that as part of our history. He came out to... Um, uh, California, Southern California, when the Dust Bowl hit and he couldn't pre- pre- preach to his people anymore because there's everybody was dying and leaving, right? He was one of the Okies that left the area, like uh, what's that Steinbeck novel? So yeah, so he was he was one of those people that had to get out of Kansas because it, it was just dying, mm-hmm. and he had no no people. He came and he became a dog catcher, right? Which I'm like, he was a catcher of souls. Now he's a catcher of dogs. <laughs> and, Some would uh, say many souls live in a dog. Yes. And, and yeah. I think there's a, a great poetry about that. And he helped fa- found Long Beach First Christian Church, which uh, he was one of the founding members. He, he, I don't know if he actually did any ministering while he was there, but he was one of the elders of the church when he came in. And then he had kind of moved on to like kind of other churches and retired by the time I was old enough to start going to church. But my dad was an elder at the church. And so we used to go all the time. And I'll say this about the Christianity that I was raised in. Yeah. Very middle of the road, mostly sweet people. Mm-hmm. Yes. There was some, some busy bodies shaking their fingers, but they were the minority. I didn't like the 19th century songs that we had to sing. We will come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Like, it's like, it's fine. It's at least it's singing. Mm-hmm. And the message was always like pretty middle of the road, nothing about hell. But being a person that kind of identified as Christian in a Christian culture, seeing how Christians treated everybody around them you with the satanic panic and wield, all that. wielded their Christianity. Yes. And so I, <laughs> like that, what, what, I realized, what I realized is like, oh, I can't be a part of this anymore. Like this is, this is, I mean, I, it was infusing in me and, it's, and so I just, but then what ended up happening before I actually became an atheist, I was, uh, made a deal with the devil. This is, I wrote about this and I'm writing a memoir right now and doing the deal with the devil made me sex and drugs and rock and roll. And I fucking had a great time by the time I, just before I kind of got turned on to Buddhism, I was a Satanist. You know, like a, you know, like I still think they're they're very free thinkers, but I was doing it as you a took rejection. My cat. Yeah, I <laughs> but like I was doing it as no, a. No, I'm serious. I buried my cat up in Griffith, and they fucking unburied her and used her in a goddamn yeah. ceremony. And I'm like, you fucking come on, man. I mean, they're, they're again. They're, they, I would say like just like anything. Yeah. There's good ones. There's bad just ones. Just like anything. And I'm and I appreciate you telling me your history. Yeah. Because I think, and I'll tell you mine because I think doesn't matter what vein you're raised in you're always going to reject it because i was raised with krishna murti and mihir baba and fucking you know all these like killer ideas about 
about life and philosophies and spirit. And yet my mom was getting beaten and put a gun to her face by her boyfriend on a daily basis. Who was part of this so tradition? We had, mm, it was because they, she didn't understand what it really meant. She just put the posters up and had the books in the house. Uh, so you can't say be here now and then get hit in the face by a guy every day. Let's, uh, we've gone already 45 minutes. Let's head back. Oh, okay. Is it yeah. done? Okay. Just uh, an hour and yeah. a half is enough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't need to talk anymore on your thing. I mean, I like talking to you, but. Yeah, yeah. I, we'll uh, go hit some thrift shops. I love and... <laughs> it. But I must say, being raised in a place where. What? That what? stuff was what? touted. You would think I would be like, what? oh, yeah, that's, you know. Oh my God, I listened to Krishnamurti. Oh, you know, Buddhism is like the best thing. But in actuality... <laughs> what? Folks, what? Barney. Get him, Barney. Yes, Get him. I, I am a... I'm a believer in dog. Well, yeah. Right, dog boys? is the only thing to believe in. Here, here. It's the I'm only like this tangible thing, thing, really. Yes. Yeah, Barney. He likes a big stick. Woo! Ah. Awkward, weird. <laughs> Get it, Barney. Bigger than him. My yeah. God. Get it. A, cha- a real challenge. So yeah, uh, go, uh, the, she she was kind of like I- into that stuff, but not really like practicing the core values. No, not practicing it at all. And so what it did was it contaminated it for me. Oh yeah, of course. So I thought to myself, growing up, hey, I, I think I need I need a religion. I need something to believe in. I had nothing to believe in. I didn't believe in shit. Yeah. I never believed in anything. You, I didn't believe in the like kindness a, of people. I didn't believe in myself. You I were a nihilist. I guess. Yeah. I didn't know what it was called. I just didn't fucking care. I was out death wish. You know, I didn't give a fuck. Uh, but then I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't ignore it. Yeah, yeah buddy, yeah. I just couldn't ignore the facts. Well, though, but you... you so uh, performing but, first, it was heroin, <laughs> <laughs> and then heroin. I mean, there's definitely a, a that's a plant medicine, and there's a god that a demon god that lives inside of it. Well, yeah, for and sure. I had I had grown up with people who celebrated heroin addicts. Yeah, all the heroes at my house had died young. Yeah, so I figured that's the way to go. Live fast, die young. Like, Sounds very familiar. Leave a cute corpse. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very familiar. Yeah. But then, you know. Well, then then the death, the suicide doesn't take. And well, you got to outlive hell? it. I couldn't fucking believe I, some guy, we'll call him an angel, just disrupted my heroin fucking problem and put me on stage. And I told a joke and the laughter wow. was way better than the dope. Wow. And I couldn't believe it. And in a weird way, what you were looking for, really, kind of like recognition, validation, affirmation. Yeah. yeah a little bit of attention. Of myself, that I actually had something to say, that something, I had a story I yeah. had to tell. And, and uh, you know, a little bit of adoration and yeah. just being able to truly be yourself. Yep. Which Speak is, I think, truth. what a lot of people miss uh, when they, like the good, the good ones. You know, maybe you're truly, you are your truly true self when you tell a jokey joke. Maybe people are. I mean, maybe, you could be. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't, it yeah. doesn't penetrate as deeply for others. Yeah. When you watch Richard Pryor talk about burning himself. Oh my God, so good. Or even Bernie Mac talking about taking in his sister, the, the drug addict's yeah. kids. Yeah. It's, it, it doesn't even compare to Cedric the Entertainer lighting a cigarette like a G. You know what I mean? Whereas, yeah. That's funny. And I laugh. And he's funny. But he's not giving us anything raw, anything real, yeah. anything that we could sink our teeth yeah. into. And again, or vibe. He's, he's telling us in his name. Yeah. Cedric I'm the an, Entertainer. I'm an entertainer. He's an entertainer. And that, so he's like... <laughs> that's he, Cedric the Deep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's like a hero that I want. <laughs> <laughs> Cedric the Deep, what's up? I mean, just the Deep. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, blah, 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 
heroin. Yeah, heroin was, it was great until it wasn't bringing me any laughs. No, oh, I wanted to ask you this, though. Yeah. You, you talk about Judaism a yeah. little bit, being, a, being a, of the people. I do now, because my mom was, uh, my mom moved to L.A. from New York got a nose job and changed her name before I was born. Okay, so she was... So I didn't know I was a Jew. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so she was real proud, you know. So what was she, <laughs> what was she running from uh, in her Judaism, do you think? I think it was just her entire family life. Okay. Her was it was it, was it Was it like Orthodox? What was going on there? No, do you know any nothing, of them? it was nothing heavy-duty religious. Oh, okay. I just think she... Well, I know she... Uh, Talk about getting away as far as you can from yourself. Yeah. Um, poor, poor why thing. she wanted to be an actress. Oh. Because she couldn't handle being in her real self. Yeah. And a friend of hers sent me... <laughs> so fucking weird, Sean. A friend of hers <laughs> sent me a, her acting reel recently. What? Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> I'd never seen it, you know? Yeah. I mean, she moved out when I was 15, so I, we didn't really have yeah. a lot of time to, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I watched she it had, and I was She like, had a so, whole secret life. Well, I knew she was an actress. Yeah, okay. But, I watched the acting reel and I realized why we were on welfare my whole life. <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> if you saw my first acting job no, on... No, this wasn't her first. This was all of them. Oh, the, the accumulated... The put together 10 yeah. minute every single thing she ever did. Well, I mean... And here's what's great though. Uh, what I learned about her. She was fan-fucking-tastic if she had to do a big character. Okay. So if she, if you had to be real... Not so good. Huh, interesting. But character. This is a Jew from New York, Queens, who got to play opposite Kevin Costner in Wyatt Earp as a ho- as a whore who bathes him. Oh wow! Shit, I'll have to it's watch that again. It's a great fucking scene. The problem is, it's a three-hour movie, and I'm a little on the fence about Kevin Costner. No, you kidding. just have to fast forward it to the horror. That's in the true. Bathroom. I just get to that scene. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Jess's mom, whore? Yeah, I want to see the whore. Let me see that fat whore. Yeah, she's a big whore, and she was always cast as a whore. Like she was in Cannery Row, she was a whore. She's always a whore, well, or like a white trashy. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Is like the archetypes that Hollywood will give. Certain women, but uh, here's yeah. what, here's the crazy thing. Nobody has told the story yet, and it was a little bit in Deadwood, but not very much, of the fucking whores that owned the fucking city. Yes, yes. The, like fucking, the reason. The huge entrepreneurs. Yes, huge fucking yeah. support. Like the that reason. That ran the town. Yeah, that ran the town. <laughs> Storyville yeah. in New Orleans, that mm-hmm. nine block area. It became the nine block area where shit could go down. Basically, the red light district, right. because and I can't remember her name, but she was literally the most powerful woman in the region, not just New Orleans. Right. Like she could have taken over Louisiana probably if she wanted, but they kept on fucking making laws against her and making laws against her, and eventually, you know, she had her nine block empire, and she died, and. You know, the stories came out about how she was giving to this orphanage and this church and da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. And it's like, no wonder she was so well-loved. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe you can play her in the movie. Well, either her or Boxcar (laughs) Annie. Do you know the story of... Boxcar Annie? Yeah, she she has the same story as Siddhartha. Oh, wow. And no one really wants to talk about it because... She was a woman, but also because she went, not just left the palace, you know, Buddha, he left his palace, he left being a prince, right, Siddhartha. He was like, I'm going out, there's nothing, I'm not, I'm not satisfied. He was like the Beatles before they went to India, right? He's like, I got all the drugs, I got all the bitches, I got all the money, and I fucking still aren't happy. Yeah. So she also came from a very, very wealthy Really? Family, yes. Wow. She disguised herself, went out, lived as a hobo, lived as a prostitute, so much so that she actually um, contracted syphilis and ended up dying in the streets. 
But Holy shit. Her last writings were about her being so grateful to have lived a real life and experienced real suffering and struggle. She said that's what it means to be a full being as a human on this planet, experiencing all factions of our lives. Yeah. And then knowing neither's really, I mean, some, it is harder to live on a train as a hobo than it is to live in a castle, but is it psychologically? Well, I'd say this. So, you know what I mean? Like she, these were the questions that she pondered. I, I, I mean, I do have a little bit of an answer to that. It's so much harder to be present in the moment in the castle, in the right. comfort of the castle, right. than it is in the discomfort of the train car. Right. And I think that if, you know, if we are God having a divine experience, God doesn't want to fucking chill in a fucking nice bed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like God yeah. wants to fucking feel what it's like to sleep on the cold fucking metal of a fucking box car. You know? Well, yeah, it's also that idea or that real fact of the matter is that it has to, you have to have dark in order to have light, right? Yes. So even right now, what I'm dealing with at my apartment, my furniture still isn't there. So Damn. I have, what, what do you got? Like a lawn chair and a fucking, uh, I have you a said TV, you bought one pot? I do. I have a TV tray, a folding <laughs> chair metal, and a blow up bed. And Damn. I have to say, and I have a prism. Like yours, the crystal that you hang in your car. Yeah. I have a loose one that I move around the house. Ah, nice. Because I go, well, at least I have rainbows. Yeah. And then that's enough for me. I go, I can make my coffee. I can write. I can talk on the phone if I need be. If I look on the computer. Whatever. All my needs are taken care of. Isn't that crazy? I don't fucking need like a four poster bed and cable TV and all this shit. That actually makes me a little bit more. <laughs> well, it's like a, oh, hello. Hello. I know you needed this so bad. He was such Yay. a grump last night because we'd been four days Yay. without a, yes, boy. Yes. Without a, yes. a hike. Yes. Look at so how happy frolicky. he is. So cute. Four days without a hike. That's insanity. So. Yeah. Probably the first four days without a hike since I got back from the meditation retreat. Which was in March? Uh, uh, Valentine's Day. February. Yeah, so it's crazy. I think my suspicion is that people, you know, made reservations for this time. And then Valentine's Day, the Oscars, and the fucking, the first primary deba debates, <laughs> or the first primary election was falling right on that week. And people were like, ah. I got, I got, I got to, I got to see what's happening. And they couldn't, uh, like, they couldn't emotionally let themselves go to the retreat. So they started canceling. Oh. That's my theory. I mean, I don't know. Cause, or, cause, 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 uh, originally it would, I think it was the end of March when my, when my real time was scheduled and I was, you know, I was like, I was happy with that. But the fact that I got in there before all this shit went down, whoo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all, I mean, when everything we're talking about, isn't it all come back to that it's all meant to be? Yes. I mean, even the people, I've lost so many people <laughs> the last few years, you know, I've had a yeah. lot of death yeah. in my life, but I must say that it's gotten to teach me an immense amount about myself and the world and love, intimacy, parental shit. Well... It's so interesting, this thing you said yesterday on your podcast, uh -oh. which, how long ago did your, uh, Ellen? Yeah. Yeah. How long ago did she die? Three years. Three years. So it's almost as if you weren't giving yourself permission. You, you kind of said this on the podcast to just say whatever it is you wanted to say, because when she was alive, you still felt that tension. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I think... I can't believe I said that because a lot of times I was telling Sean for the listeners that are with us, I was telling Sean earlier that I a lot of times don't remember what I say on my show because there's very much of spirit invoke, you know, it's yeah, coming through. Yeah. So it's interesting though. The spirit that you're invoking is like past Jess. Well, <laughs> you're you're tapping into that. It is a good time. I have a good time. 
but I also are having these intense epiphanies about, um, uh, I have friends that are scared about their parents dying. So I've been talking about that a lot recently. So I feel like it crept into my subconscious. Sure, sure, sure. And it was a message. So you're, but you're yeah. basically an orphan now, right? Say what? You're basically an orphan. I mean, I always was. Yeah, well, <laughs> That's the thing. Oh man, you're a Disney princess. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. We just have to find your kingdom and put you on the throne. I'm here, bro. This is it. <laughs> you made it. Yes. Okay. Find me some John Redcorn, motherfucker. Well, it's, it's funny because my mom's in full-time care. I kind of consider myself three quarters of the way to being an orphan, three quarters of an orphan. Yeah. Because she's not dead yet, so I haven't felt that catharsis, but spiritually, emotionally, mentally, she's not there. Like there's, I have no, like I have no one of that generation. I have an aunt maybe or an uncle I could reach out to. Yeah, I have an aunt. But nobody of that generation that I can rely on. I mean, you never could. could. Pardon me. Yes, you never could. That's true. That's true. P.S. I, that generation I, sucks assholes. It's true. I will say, <laughs> I mean, uh, 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 my dad was somewhat a little bit more reliable than my mom, who yeah. was just an asshole. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but that generation. Was. he just had a weak character, and he was broken by her. Well, like, yeah. Yeah. How rebellious. So have you come to the part yet? Where you start to have compassion for your parents' upbringing? I, I mean, I love, like, my dad is like, poor, sad dad that he got wrapped up with my monster of a mother, Aaron. But one of these pathways to forgiveness for my mom is kind of a little bit of a pathway to forgiveness for myself. Uh, there's right. a book called Neurotribes, which is a, the history of autism. Mm-hmm. And as I'm reading it, he's talking about these female autistics oh boy and i'm going oh shit that's my fucking mom yeah i used to call her robot mom she was like she read the dr spock book about how to be a mother and she just did all of the tasks but you know the damage comes in her inability to express emotions and be social and like her true self yeah like her real her real handicap that she had right you know and so when I read that, I was like, oh, I'm probably a little bit on the spectrum. We all are. And yeah. I can see the blending. <laughs> what did you just see, Barney? I could see the blending of, you know, my, my father was, you know, salt of the earth, sweet, gentle spirit, just literally just broken by my mom uh-huh. and her expectations about what a man should be. And then Robo Mom, who just had her ideas about the way the world should be. Right. And so I have those in me, those yeah. two spirits. Yeah. And uh, so I forgive her because I used to think she was a true sociopath. Like I used to think she had no emotional reserve and that she couldn't empathize with other human beings. Because I, when I was like 10 or 11 years old, I hurt somebody's feelings and they cried or something like that. And in that moment, I was like, oh, people have real feelings. We're not all just faking our feelings. Because <laughs> I had that dealing with my mom. Right. She was always crying crocodile te- tears and manipulating me. Mm-hmm. So I just started doing the same thing. Yeah. To out-fucking manipulate her, <laughs> you know. And so I thought she was just a sociopath. Yeah. Like, I thought she just had no emotional reserves for other people. This made me forgive her and like, oh... She was basically a developmentally disabled woman right. who was never identified that was forced to raise two children on her own. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's why I ask because it, 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 there usually is some sort of stem to the madness. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, my mom definitely was uh, mentally disabled in a lot of ways. And yeah. She hurt children. She was a she was a molester. She was a monster yeah. to children and was fired numerous times. <sighs> From nanny jobs. Damn. Well, okay, let me ask I you I didn't this. really understand what that meant as a kid because I was always protecting her. Yes. And I, she would tell me stories of other people. But then as I got older, I realized, realized it was her. They were stories about she and I. Whoa. Oh, it was so Fucking crazy. It's so hard. 
And then you go, oh my God, how do I not hate this fucking woman? And then I go, God, she must have... I've had a cat who I feel more loving towards than she treated me. Like I go, you know, this lady was fucking disturbed. This... And, and then maybe you look at some photographs and stuff. And my poor mom, she never looked in the camera. Yeah. She never once looked the same way that everybody else was. Where the fuck is this bitch looking? Yeah. Where is she? What is she looking yeah. at? Right there it is. It's yeah. right there. It's right there. Gone. Seriously. Gone. Seriously. In another dimension. Yeah. And, and fucking bless her for not killing me. On well, the way up. Well, let me ask you this. because yeah. I, I, was, I thinking, was in danger a lot. A lot, for sure. But, uh, let me ask you this, because I yeah. think there's a very particular psychological disease that is, that is transmitted in a very particular way. And it's like, if you were touched as a child... Mm-hmm. Sometimes you will go and touch other people. Oh yeah, you know. So, so it's this very interesting way in which this disease is communicated to other people. Oh you no, know? I molested a runaway. I used to take in runaways when I was because I was fifteen. Yeah, on my own. And you, my were t- mom left the hotel room we lived in, so I would let runaways spend the night there. And one of them was like my, I could like abuse her. Yeah, she's your doll. And it just seemed like that was normal. Sure, because that's what you were raised in. Yeah, and it never seemed weird, and it never seemed wrong, and it never seemed like anything she didn't want to do either. Or, yeah. You well, know, and, and, and again, maybe she, she, maybe she had been primed for that, and the reason she was running she away. Had. She because, ran away from a house yeah. that was like that, and then she ran into my house that was like that. But, well, yeah, and again, we're all in a weird way kind of like... Like, you know, whatever. It's like, fucking, you got to have sex. Are you going to use the sex to fucking perpetuate your trauma or heal your trauma? Well, sometimes it's both. <laughs> right, or sometimes you're just a kid and you don't fucking know no. better. Yeah. And that, that kid I've had to forgive for a lot of things. Yeah. And a lot of my friends died at that time in my life. I was a teenage hooker with my friend's grandma used to pimp us out as children. Like, <laughs> it was so intense. And yeah. yet... I just thought that's what everyone was doing. I thought that how, was how everyone how are, lived. How are your disassociating skills? Now? Yeah. Not, just, no, you, you don't disassociate well anymore. Not now. No, you see, because I, yeah. I will tell you, the guy downstairs who was texting me and saying, you know, I, I'm really going to be honest with you. I think you're really beautiful. I would love it if sometime we could cuddle. To me, it freaked me right out. Because yeah, yeah. I, my child said to me, Come on, Jessica. He's in a wheelchair. It would make him feel better. Damn. My adult witnessed my child and my adult said, no, baby, we don't have to do that anymore. Holy shit. I could cry right now. That shit was so deep and powerful. And then I was like, want to take a bubble bath? Yeah. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Do I still sleep with a stuffed animal? Yes. Are you fucking kidding me right now? I'll tell you, though, I, I realized... Oh, no, I want to get to this thing that happened to me just last night or the night before. Um, but I realized that disassociation was my fucking superpower when I was a kid. <laughs> when you're a kid, yeah, yeah you turn well, it right I was off. just like, fucking go somewhere else. Oh, hell yeah. I'm gone, baby. Beep. It was fucking amazing. And then when I, you know, so you start coming into your body and you do therapy and psychedelics and stuff like uh-huh. that. You, you like, oh, shit. I, had sh- I basically shut off. So much of the trauma. It's still there. The body takes the score or whatever, whatever that book is. Uh, but I have a, um, so I'm doing this kind of therapy, somatic experiencing. Mm-hmm. And my friend is learning how to do it. So she's giving me some free sessions. Yes. And. Uh, One of my best friends is a soma Oh, sh- it's, it's so fucking powerful. Yeah. So we, you know, we, I had this neck thing, a back thing, blah, blah, blah. We went through all that. <laughs> Last time we talked, yeah. and she's very good because she's intuitive, and she comes at it from a little bit of an oblique angle, and then these things come out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw my mom mm. stab my father, right? Mm. So the basic idea is my dad is there, to, and she's like, you got to give me child support. And he's got the checkbook out, and he's yelling at her, and she's yelling at him. And she picks up the pen, and she fucking stabs him in the fucking chest with the pen, Jesus. right? Yeah. So I see blood. I see the blue ink mm. on his white shirt, red, white, and blue. Got God bless America. Um, Looking at your bag right now. Yes. That you're oh yeah, shit. That's right. God bless America, it's a baby. Big thing of blue with some. But red then I realized, it. and also he showed me later on, he had a little tiny kind of ink mark that it was under the skin, mm-hmm. like a tattoo. And I was like, oh, oh, I'm trying to figure out that trauma by getting tattoos myself. Yeah. 
by, by taking being in the, uh, it's like the, what I said to her. And I think it's true is like, I was both titillated by the violence, like, Oh my God, something's happening. And I was horrified and it was all these complex emotions. And I was in that time I had been so identified with my mother. Yeah. Like I was just like, I don't know. I was just, we were one in the same. We had no boundaries. The enmeshment is dangerous. Enmeshment. There it is. Yeah. But that's what women, that's what mothers do to their kids who they need to take care of them. Yeah. And, and again, I think it's part of a natural, uh, um, what's it called? Process, um, developmental process. It uh, is, but it, it's, it's but, dangerous when it envelops the child. Yes. And, it, and yes. the fears of the parent are pushed and the, you know, onto the kid. It's like my mom used to say to me all the time, Jesse, put on a sweater. I'm freezing. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. And then I'd uh, say, God, mom, you know, oh, poor little dad's guy. such a pervert. He's such a pervert. I really am so uncomfortable with him all the time. And she'd go, I know he's a pervert, honey. So then stop dropping me off with him, Ugh. you know? Ugh. So a lot of the stuff, uh, why do you go back to the guy who hits you in the face and threatens your life with guns? Because we have great sex. Well, yeah. Well, but the crazy people definitely have better sex. <laughs> well, that was a joke that I used to do, Sean, where I would say, you know how that there's that saying, like, the crazier the person, the better the sex is? And I never could find anybody as crazy as my... Uh, oh, damn. It's well, me. Hey, we're trying to reach deep into the deepest, brokenest part of ourselves. Yeah. And the only way to get th to that is by a lot of fucking whips and chains and creepiness and yeah. perversion. Well, I have a joke about the apocalypse of what's your skill, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, dick sucking. And my friend goes, oh, Jessica, that's not a skill. And I said, first of all, I feel bad for you. Yeah. I said, and I know there are four or five men in this audience right now who are looking at me going, I'd give that lady fresh water. Yes, absolutely. So then, and then I do this whole thing about being a Jew and sucking a dick and I want people to like me, you know? And it's very much t tapping into a really true place. So have you heard of this, uh, this idea called constellations? No. You know what this is? No. So I happened on it. It's a kind of, so it is ancestral, healing ancestral trauma. Oh, and the constellations are the constellations of trauma that are in each generation. Oh, like the DNA stuff. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting because I when I, that. you know, you, you don't, you don't, you don't know your dad, but, uh, or whatever, but, or the, the guy I mean, that I you were being, do. yeah, the guy you were being dropped off with, whoever yeah. there's, I mean, there's, he's got his own trauma, but Whatever it was, let's say that your mother was running away from whatever that thing, it's like, oh, how many generations has, are you the beneficiary of right. all that craziness? And we all are. Well, I think we, all of I us. I talk a lot to my friends about that, especially my black friends who come from yeah. slave, you know, their, yeah. their ancestors were slaves. Yeah. And even for, a, you know, for me, I just have, you know, the, the Jewish ghetto um, Orchard Street, and Schmatas, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Those are my great, great people. So the history of trauma is pretty deep yeah. in my ancestral line. Well, I think it's, and I would say, like, yes, I think it's a lot of us, especially those of us that are, you know, whatever, white trash, whatever it is, black people, you know, we still are, are the, the trauma is like close like our fucking pulse, right? Yeah, it's still it's right there. on the surface. And those motherfuckers that are running the planet... They want to keep us reminded of it. Or they haven't really experienced it because they've been in their fucking Castle. castles. <laughs> and it's so like, just fucking suit up and show up. And it's like, get the fuck out of here. Your fucking, your great-grandfather fucking scanned my great-grandfather out of some shit. Yeah. And I'm fucking here now fucking telling you to fuck right off. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, and I think we're of this generation specifically, Gen, Gen X yes. and Y and maybe the millennials, we are, should just get a fucking full ride scholarship to not have to do shit. <laughs> <laughs> because we would, we're, we're like, 
Well, that's but, happening, though, don't you think, Sean? A little I mean, bit, I, yeah. I think we're taking it upon ourselves to leave the corporate work world. Yes. We're taking it upon ourselves to make mystical jobs make money. Yeah. Uh, we're taking it upon ourselves to to bring back the idea that storytelling is the one thing that really matters when people, when we lose the grid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Being able to sit in we'll front of the fire. Gather. Sit in front of the fire with yeah. a few people and say, hey, it was like this. Yep. We don't have to do that anymore. Right. Yeah, I think We're, it's a, that's a huge piece. I think that's coming back. My uh, one of my biggest, most profound mushroom journeys as part of my, uh, you know, mushroom cult. I was in now. It was just a, a mushroom group <laughs> up in the Bay Area. But the, when I had my death trip, the thing that re- was revealed to me is like all of this is just a gigantic narrative. Yeah. Right from yeah, the over. Big Bang. Is basically like just the fucking opening scene, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And then there's all these tributaries and you know looping stories and this and that, and you just happen to be in your story, telling your story right now. Yep. Yeah. Just like others before us. Yeah. And we just hand it down, you know. Yep. I mean, we. A lot of the talk of Vedas, a lot of the talk of Soma. Uh, oh. really is appealing to friends of mine who are studies of Shakespeare, studies of Greek uh, chorus, theater, improvisation. All that stuff lends itself. Yeah. You know, Shakespeare fucking created words. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. How insane is that shit? Oh, well, it's amazing. And you, again, you're inspiring me because I was one of these young, creative people that would kind of like want to invent a new word every few months, you know, want yeah. to fucking coin a new phrase. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, for some reason, either I forgot, like, I feel like that's definitely a part of my consciousness is this constant forgetting or somebody disinhibited me from wanting to do it said, Oh, that's stupid. Or why are you using like probably when I went and took some English course and they're like, what's this word mean? Right. And I was like, I made it up. Were you giving me a B? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> or if you have, you know, I had a real severe um, throat and uh, chest infections as a child. Like constantly Oof. the swelling of the tonsils and the throat and the throat and the throat and the throat. And I realized it's because they kept telling me to shut the fuck up. Yeah. Fucking sit down and shut up. Just Fucking shut the fuck up. Mind your own business. Doing? Well, how do you not know that? I'm five, you dicks. Yeah. How would I know that? Yeah. And that's the idea of, of putting the, the kind of pressure on a child to know before they've been taught. I, I, yeah, I would like to say that that is probably worse than any physical uh, <laughs> abuse. How you doing, sir? Oh, he's jamming. Jamming it out. Be careful. We've, Be careful got a, we've got a wild coyote here. <laughs> <laughs> He's vicious. Barney. Oh, watch out, bud. <laughs> Stop being a punk. <laughs> Come on, Barnacle. Barnacle. Yeah, it's, I, I get a little self-conscious with other people on the trail because I get yelled at a lot for not having him on a leash. Really? Uh, I'd say... In Los Angeles, I imagine. Well, actually, just in Tucson... Really? But yeah, but it was a very specific. Yeah, it was a I'm very sorry. specific hike that was like a preserve, and I, I had them off leash, and there was not supposed to be any dogs there, so I was getting oh, yelled at a lot there. So, well, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Uh, but I think people are like, they have this, you know, predisposition to think a dog's going to attack them if they're off the, a leash, and I get it; it's fine. But yeah, Barney looks pretty gnarly. <laughs> and, and again, like, who's scared of a dog that size? People are. Jesus. People are. And, Gosh. you know, sometimes he senses it. And he'll fucking... I saw some, he run somebody up a fence a little bit. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and hilarious. I felt bad, but they were like, oh, no, it's okay. And I was like, okay. If you say so. But well, yeah. Can I ask you about this tree right here? Did this just fall? Like, it just Yeah, fell? so it's got some kind of... It, this like is an a, infection? So this is, this is what they call cellulose. Yeah, some kind of tree disease got into it. And just slowly over time, probably like... that looks fire. That, that may have been. Burned. Well, the, mm, it's interesting, but this is definitely like this is a, w- the wood rot or whatever. It's a yeah. fungus or a, a, a bacteria. Maybe. Is it on that right there? Is that what that is? That's cracking that tree right there? 
This little guy in front of us? Mm, it could be, but usually the younger trees have better immune systems so they can fend it off. Or yeah. it'll get in it and just fucking grow and grow and grow. And then when it gets to this size, it's like, then the it fucking, it's like, it. ah, I <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I knew you'd fucking, you know. Wow. So, but I think, so, you know, the good thing about that fallen log, obviously, is like now it's going to fill up with mycelia, uh, which is mushrooms. All of these fallen trees are the perfect kind of uh, environment for no mushrooms. No way. No way. Psychedelic? So, well, any mushroom. So mushrooms grow inside of like wood pulp and rot- rotting ro- wood. So yes, you could grow. I thought it was poopoo. Well, you could. That's that's a very specific uh, kind of. I, I want to say Amanita mascara up in the northwest. But yes, you have to have some poop. Poop is good because it's porous and it's got all kinds of stuff in it. But yeah, you do wood pulp, poop. Sometimes it's moss, like chunks of like peat moss. Can I ask you this now, mushroom man? Yes. Um, <laughs> last time I did mu- the last time I did mushrooms, and I didn't want to, which I know had a lot to do with my trip. But yes, for sure. Um, and the guy I was with lit the house on fire by accident. <laughs> oh, there was a lot That's going exciting. on in that trip. But yeah. Let me ask you this, because I'm a lover of acid, yes. I love acid so much more. Yes. Is it because, Sean, acid is outside and mushrooms are so inside? I See, here's the way I look at it, because I yeah. mostly microdose on acid, and then occasionally once every year or two, I will megadose on mushrooms. Well, I saw all my ancestors. I'm sorry to interrupt you, yeah, but yeah. I did see all my ancestors last time. And they were all telling me everything was going to be cool. They were in a spiral holding hands. Like, it was awesome. All my dead people showed up for well, me. That, yeah. But. It was still a difficult. I think. It I was think, very difficult. So I think what it is, it's two things. I think it's the possibility of having a difficult journey on mushrooms is much higher because set in setting really matter. I cannot. If yeah. I do not fast for six hours. Before I do mushrooms, yeah. I will not have a good trip because my stomach will be upset. Oh, so that's first off. So right, it's, you know yourself. Yeah. Now. So that's the first thing, and then also setting like, yeah. fucking getting out of nature or fucking being around trusted people. No, we had no connection. It made me very sad. Yeah. Because so, he talked me into it in the romance. Ah, uh, and he said it'll this. make us be closer. It'll bring us closer intimately. It and, should have been MDMA. <laughs> Well, I didn't know what to think. He made tea and he just made it too strong. I think yeah. I drank an eighth. Woo! And it was so... That's almost a hero dose. I was so gone. And, and I, I mean, I was there, but I was gone and I didn't, I didn't love it. I really didn't. Well, and also probably you didn't love him. I, I did. I was yeah. obsessed. Yeah. And he was somebody who I thought I needed to help. Yeah, but he sure. also showed me a picture of his... his uh, he had this female friend who had just had a baby... And I'm losing my ability to have a baby now. Yeah, yeah. So he, like, came over and he showed that to me when we were tripping. Ugh. And it totally, I took it personally. Soured. Yeah, soured it. Yeah. You can't not, like, though. That's when you're on you a me powerful. A baby? While you're on a powerful psychedelic, <laughs> it is nearly impossible for you to separate yourself from that energy. Yeah. It's nearly, but I'll yeah. say this about acid because Thank it's you. made in a lab. Yeah. <laughs> and there are strict. It's more stricter kind of like controls yeah. on it. You mean um, in the making of it? In the making of it. Yeah. You're going to get a little more of a consistent dose. I feel that uh, LSD for me helps me unwind, let's say, intellectual problems. Uh-huh. Helps me think through the problems where mushrooms throw me into a realm where I have to fight demons emotionally. Where it's like, so it is. So it's feeling versus, versus thinking. thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That's what doing? I think. Hey, yeah. good afternoon. Good stuff. Um, well, I love that because that's, but that's what I think. I don't think I get as intellectual because, you know, my nickname used to be Fry Baby as a kid. <laughs> you ate because so much I acid. took so much acid and I would go to punk rock shows, well, which well, is I like mean, makes the sense. most insane but that's how i grew up it was around sense. violence and craziness yeah but the child it's ritualizing the feeling inside to, of you. Yeah, yeah so the child so what would happen is i'd show up at these shows i'd have a bag of toys under my oh, arm fuck yeah and i would sit in the parking lot and wait and every child every punk rock fucking toughy you know mohawky fucking kid who had missed their childhood gathered around hey come here Oh, there you are. Whew. I mean, gathered yeah. 
like it was well you were you were uh, on some levels you were doing a shamanic yeah ritual. I was ritualizing their yeah. their childhood i do have to pee okay i'm gonna pee too is, there a, la- is there a lady in here uh, uh, no, no probably not oh it stinks so bad mm-hmm. this one's not so bad because it's been open here can you hold my oh no oh, absolutely here here here, here, here it's here, okay oh, i can put okay. it under this it's all right i just it smelled like poo- oh it's just doo-doo everywhere ah! it's gotta happen doo-doo I gotta wear my mask and just try to close this. Oh my god! You're not gonna oh be god. able to do it. I'm just gonna wear my mask. Oh, am I still on the mic? It's so disgusting. You guys are gonna hear me pee. Ah! Ah! Turn on. Wait. I don't oh. want you to hear me. Well, here's I don't want you to Let's hear me stop. peeing. Let's just stop the podcast. Yeah. I'm like, stop. <laughs> stop. I, I have to pee. Like... I'm screaming about shit. That's like, it smells like shit. I will say uh, this is off of the spot. Where the podcast ends when somebody has to go to the bathroom. Oh my god, that'd be so bad. Wait, hold on to that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, shut it off. And cut.